Hello my new year new peeps, but also old peeps, of course. This is Ket, aka Kakibot, and today I am bringing you an overview of everything that's gonna be exciting, and maybe also not so exciting, in Scotland and Edinburgh in the year 2023. If you're planning a visit, or if you're even planning to move here, then definitely stick around. This video is gonna be packed with interesting facts about what museums and galleries are gonna be opening, and what the newness we're expecting here in Edinburgh, and also how the live here has changed in the past year and how that's kind of affecting us going into 2023. So yeah, let's get started. We're gonna start with the good stuff because I think that uh, I don't want to bum you out like, in January. You're probably already bummed out because you have to go back to work and you know Christmas is over and all of that. So yeah, let's start with the nicey bits. Like the National Gallery of Scotland opening a brand new space this summer. You might have noticed, especially throughout like last two or three years that that whole area in Prince's Garden around the galleries was kind of a work in progress. Um, the gallery was still open, but what was actually happening is there was like an excavation work underneath the old museums, um, because now they're going to be opening some new space that's going to be dedicated to specifically Scottish art. So for you visiting loving Scottish history and culture, that's going to be something to put on your list for sure. If you're interested in traveling a bit further, then on the west coast, kind of close to Glasgow, in Paisley, there's an arts Center that's going to be reopening in 2023. It's not a new art center per se. I think that they opened in like the 90s, but in the past couple of years it has been closed down because they wanted to renovate. So if you visit it in 2023, just after it was opened again, then you know, you're gonna have a very shiny new experience and you know, you're just gonna be one of the first people ever to experience the Paisley Art Center with your own eyeballs. Maybe if you're not just into art, but also into things like history and archaeology, you might be interested in the Kilmartin Museum, which is kind of even further towards the west. So I don't, it probably counts as west coast. It's not an island, but there's basically, if you're in Glasgow and you go like a bit north, then you're, you're getting kind of onto like this like peninsula. That's a, uh, it's a bit phallic, but down there is Kilmartin. <laughs> Uh -huh. which, which is going to be opening their new and renovated museum with like a new study space and everything uh, in 2023. And if you're in that area, if you're like a more advanced Scotland traveler, then maybe consider this museum also visiting it, supporting it, sharing the love. And of course, as always, in 2023, just like in any other year, we are getting a lot of fresh new exhibits that you can visit in the museums and galleries that are already established. For example, the v &A in Dundee, which, you know, hasn't been around for like decades. It's a relatively new museum. And if you haven't been there, if you haven't been to Dundee at all, perhaps, I still recommend going there, especially in the summer when Edinburgh gets quite busy and even Glasgow gets that like big city, like it, it can also get a bit much. I think going to somewhere like Dundee, which is kind of like by the water, it's kind of like open to one side. A lot of people who are from Dundee will tell you not to come because they hate it, but uh, I did have such a nice impression of it. And if you went there even for like a half day and went to the v &A Museum there, then from, I believe, spring 2023, you can visit a brand new exhibit on Scottish Tartan, which once again, might be right up your alley if you're interested in Scottish culture. Back down here, down south in Edinburgh, in the Duco Studios, we are getting an exhibit on female artists in uh, Scottish history, which to me feels like it's kind of inspired by the uh, Story of Art Without Men book, which has been a great bestseller in 2022 by Kate Hessel. Um, yeah, so I think that's starting in July and it's gonna last all the way to January. We are also getting some musicals coming to Edinburgh, visiting us. We're gonna be getting Annie, we're gonna be getting Six, we're gonna be getting a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show, among some others. I think Shrek the Musical is coming towards the end of the year. Don't forget that in Edinburgh, it's not like in London, you usually get the show on for a couple of days. So if you want to visit the show while you're in Edinburgh, uh, it is good to get the tickets in advance. Um, yeah, another thing that's coming to Edinburgh when it comes to shows is the Game Grumps on tour show, which is where we're going. <laughs> we're not gonna be seeing musicals, but we will go see Game Grumps. I think that's in the Usher Hall, so quite a fancy space. <laughs> Last time I, I went there, it was for like Brian Ferry and his jazz orchestra. So <laughs> yeah, can't wait. That is on May the 4th. 
you know, may the fourth be with you. Uh, I'm pretty sure that wasn't a part of their plan. It just kind of worked out. If you are also planning to go to the Game Grumps show in May in Edinburgh, let me know in the comments below. We can definitely say hi to each other and just kind of like, you know, fan out over Game Grumps coming. Ah. Also, Time for a little fun fact. Scotland got a brand new city in 2022. It is Scotland's eighth city and that's Dunfermline, which is kind of close to Edinburgh. I think that if you took probably the train there, it would take you maybe like 40 minutes. Uh, I think that they have like a really nice abbey there. I've seen a couple of pictures and it looks really sweet and we will definitely visit it this year just for like a little day trip, make a video about it so you can, you know, make that decision, informed decision on your own. Um, but yeah, I think it's quite a cool little fun fact that we now have a new city and congratulations to you, Dunfermline. You rock. Okay, so back in Edinburgh, we are hopefully finally getting that tram line all the way to New Haven, <sighs> which is unbelievable. Like if you are a local in Edinburgh, then you probably agree with me that it has been extremely hard to go down into Leith, like to drive there, but even to take the bus because on Leith Walk, which is kind of, you know, the, the central sort of artery that takes you to Leith, some of the bus stops were taken away for the tram works, but also it was kind of like changing up every month or so. And now at this point in January, you can definitely see quite a lot of progress. I would say that like the works on Leith Walk seem to be basically like getting there. And I've heard from my friends who live kind of further in Leith that they feel pretty optimistic. Obviously, if like me, you've lived through <laughs> the original tram works of, you know, like the, the city center to airport, you know that you can't really trust everything the city council is telling you. Um, so don't get too excited. I think that the official date is April 2023. Mm, I think it's relatively realistic to expect the trams to happen like before the end of the year. I would be surprised if they didn't start them up by like summer, you know, end of summer. And when that happens, I think that for a lot of you who have maybe visited in the past couple of years, but didn't make it down to Leith or it just didn't feel very inviting. And maybe, you know, the, there was just a lot of movement in terms of like what shops and cafes and restaurants are, you know, capable of surviving around Leith Walk. Um, all of that is gonna kind of slowly solve itself as the tram comes into Leith. I think it's gonna open up that whole area to so many of you. It's gonna make it so much easier. I don't know about you, but I actually super much prefer trams to buses. Um, obviously right now the problem is that the tram line is very limited. I would love to know what you think because um, obviously you, if you are a local or if you've lived in Edinburgh for an extended amount of time, maybe you just found buses are just so practical or like they connected you with the spot where you needed to be that like trams didn't even like come to mind when you were considering how to get places. For me, you know, we live so close to Haymarket that it just makes sense to like hop on the tram from time to time and it's just it just feels so so smooth and clean and it's this like white whale just floating through i don't know like sensorically pleasant edinburgh is also set to have two new street food markets in 2023 one of them is next to or kind of inside the omni center so really close to the slightly divisive st james center but you know Objectively, that's a very convenient area. Uh, I don't quite know what the name of that is supposed to be. I don't think that's quite out yet, but I believe that they are supposed to be opening at like end of winter. So they should really <laughs> hurry up with coming up with a name, but you know, it's gonna be convenient. I think that there's supposed to be about like 10 vendors at one time. It's kind of like both indoor outdoor space. And again, it's in the city center. So for a lot of you, it's probably gonna be the more convenient choice but we also have our cult favorite, which is the Pit Market, which uh, traditionally used to be on Pit Street in Leith, which honestly already wasn't a super easy location to get to from the city center. But you know, it was, it was okay. Now they're moving to Granton, which when I first thought about that, because that's like, if you went down to Leith and then kind of further kind of along the seaside, to the west, basically. And at first, when I thought about it, I was thinking, 
mm, that seems like so far, like how are people gonna be getting there? But when I kind of looked it up on Google Maps, turns out it's only really like 25 minutes by bus from Princess Street, so I think that compared to getting to Pitt Street from Princess Street, it's basically the same. And the space looks amazing. It looks like it's gonna be this like open space next to the seaside with a lot of like event space also. And um, I'm pretty sure they got some funding because they're trying to support young people getting into hospitality industry. And obviously they've always been very supportive of the local food scene because, you know, a lot of great places like think Mupai Gelato, I believe had kind of like started around pit market before they opened their own shop so i think it's a really cool place to keep your eye on um because yeah that is the spot where a lot of like local food legends will be starting off now i previously mentioned the st james center which i mean at this point is pretty much full of shops and restaurants and it just feels like it's a pretty done situation but one thing that's missing is the w hotel that's actually going to be housed in the orange peel call it what you want in my household we call it orange peel because we are not crass also we are going to be welcoming two kind of like london favorites. Uh, one of them is Sushi Samba, which is kind of like a Latin American Japanese fusion. Um, the other one is Duck and Waffle, which in London is like a 24-7 opening hours um, Duck and Waffle restaurant, I think. Is it in the Shard? I don't, I'm not sure. It's like in one of the, it's in one of those like ridiculous buildings they have there. So we're going to be opening one of our own one in our ridiculous building, St. James Center. And I don't think that it's gonna be open for 24 hours a day. I think it's gonna have a much more kind of Edinburgh-esque uh, schedule, but uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited. I think that this is also kind of a divisive topic because like a couple of years ago, we started getting all of these like London sort of food scene legends like Dishoom and Oaxaca and I think that obviously like these are places that like move here and they kind of take some of that like shine from the local food producers and you know res restaurateurs. Re restaurateurs? Yeah, just without the silly wording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also at this point it is so expensive to go down to London that on like some level I'm kind of happy that some of these places are just thinking like, yeah, let's open one in the north. Before I get into the more practical side of this video, let me just say that if you're interested in both practical info about Scotland and living here and moving here and, you know, like Edinburgh-centric tips and tricks and also reviews of new restaurants and how to support, you know, indie legends of the Edinburgh food scene, don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell because that way you're gonna always know when I, you know, I'm coming at you with some more tipperoos. Anyway, okay, so now it's gonna get dark. No, it's, it's just gonna get slightly less fun because um, I mentioned before, um, traveling is quite, quite hard now. And there are multiple reasons for it. Um, I would say that the umbrella of all of this nonsense right now is the, as someone on Twitter called it, the cozy lives, the cost of living crisis. Um, yeah. I feel like everyone in Europe, everyone around the world is having some level of sort of economic issue right now. Like I'm pretty sure that we're all dealing with um, some amount of this. Um, however, in Britain specifically, we have kind of spent past couple of months dealing with a lot of strikes. Um, there's quite a large NHS backlog and also like a lot of things are simply just more expensive now um like very noticeably so so i guess that i just wanted to mention these three things um just because if you are either moving here or visiting then um it's pretty important to keep this in mind because if you are moving here I would say, you know, if you're doing some research into how much things cost, it's very important to actually find some data, some resources that will tell you how much things cost like right now, because like the prices have gone up by, you know, like 
tens of percent since last year even. So if you were visiting last year, if you came here for a trip and you felt like, ah, oh, this is like pretty okay, like maybe on the expensive side, but I can do this, you might feel differently this year. That said, I think that if you do have a vacation budget, if you do have a nice budget for a nice holiday, please do come here. <laughs> like, we need that money. <laughs> we need the money in the economy. Like, Edinburgh specifically is obviously a very sort of um, tourist economy heavy place and uh, we would not survive without you. So please bring your foreign money. Uh, spend it on small businesses if you're ever deciding if, it, you know, whether to get like a bucket of coffee from a chain, which I don't judge, I do that too. Or if, you know, you're gonna get a nice little flat white from a small coffee shop, then perhaps, you know, pour some of that nice visitor money into the small coffee shop. They will love you for it and um, it will make this a much better place to live for all of us and possibly you too if you ever move here, maybe. One more thing, if you're feeling generous, if you're visiting and if you ever go to a supermarket, maybe consider getting like a pack of pasta or like pasta sauce or tinned veggies or something like that and drop it in the food bank box after the checkout because food banks are really struggling right now because, you know, most people are having issues with their family budget. Um, so people are donating less and also a lot more people are relying on the food banks. So if you feel like you can afford that, and honestly, I think that if you are coming and you are on some sort of more vacationing budget, I think this is not gonna make much of a difference to you, but it might make a difference to some great local people. So yeah, just food for thought. I was also mentioning that travel is a bit of a pain in the butt. I meant local travel within the UK. Um, mostly trains, obviously, you know, petrol is very expensive, but still, like, at least you can kind of rely on <laughs> being able to get it and being able to travel if you have a car or if you rent a car. But trains have become quite hard to predict in terms of are they gonna run? How much are they gonna cost? Um, Am I gonna get a seat? Because, you know, there have been so many stories in the news now about, you know, trains being overbooked. Obviously what usually happens is that instead of like six trains running in a day, some days you get only three instead of those six. So obviously all of those people get like bunched into those three. Then, you know, you get people who have paid for seats just like sitting on the floor next to the toilet. Um, obviously I don't wanna like fear monger, like it doesn't always happen, but it happens more and more. So <laughs> obviously there will be places and situations in which you just have to rely on trains. And I mean, we have most recently taken a train to Glasgow and like it was totally fine. But admittedly, the first train we were going to take was canceled, but we were lucky enough to travel outside of the peak hours. So like maybe that's like a bit of a tip. The train costs have also gone up quite a lot. Um, like right now, some of the tickets that I've seen in like a month or two going from Edinburgh to London in economy were around like 100 pounds and that was not like peak days or times at all, which seems a lot, like that's pretty mad. Um, yeah, but what other options do you have? 10 hours on a coach? <laughs> okay, well, Anyway, I don't want to dissuade you from using the trains, but um, just so you know, the strikes are happening. They are predicted to be happening for possibly up to next six months, because God knows at what point we're gonna uh, fix this. I mean, this is not really, like the ball isn't really in our side of the court right now. We're waiting for the government to do something. Um, in general, it seems like the Scottish government is slightly more amicable to like, paying people who are on strikes more. So maybe in Scotland things are gonna get better faster, but it's hard. Also, you know, the hospitals are kind of overworked. Again, I just read an article today that that's kind of the case everywhere. I've read that even in Sweden. I imagine that Sweden is this like amazing place where, you know, you pay 60% of your income as a tax and then you live in this like all-inclusive wonderland. Um, but apparently it's almost just as bad there in hospitals as it is here now. Um, but yeah, like maybe if you have like some sort of semi-serious health issues, maybe wait for this to blow over. 
<laughs> if it's hopefully it's gonna. Uh, <sighs> okay, now I really feel like I've bummed everyone out. Sorry, this is the first video of 2023 and I'm doing this, but I just thought it would be practical to tell you, like it's, it's important knowledge that you should have. Um, people always tell me that I do kind of, you know, I, I, I panic people out, like in my video about safety in, in Edinburgh, but I'm just trying to kind of like, I'm more of that like, don't be naive, <laughs> like be prepared, be aware sort of person. So yeah, you know, that, that's the sort of like framing you should take this in. Anyway, what I wanted to end with is Fringe. It's happening between the 4th and 28th of August, which kind of feels like that's basically all of August, right? So like if you're planning to come in August, keep it in mind because like you will have to attend the Fringe whether you want to or not. <laughs> that's like the Fringe is not something that you can choose to attend. Fringe attends you. Um, <laughs> I think I do have a couple of dates though. I'm gonna like blast some like cold line on my face now. Mm, which undertones? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so apparently the first shows will be revealed on February the 16th. So maybe you can, you know, give someone a Valentine's gift of being like, let's wait two days and then I'm gonna buy you some tickets for something fancy. Um, then the second batch on March 30th and the whole program is gonna be available on June the 8th. Um, as always, if you want to see any of the big names, the headliners, a lot of those I think are already on, like Daniel Sloss, he has some dates up. Frankie Boyle also, I think, has a date or two for the summer already. Uh, chances are he's gonna have like a proper, like a fringe ongoing daily thing, but he has like two shows or one show at the Playhouse. So if you're like super invested into seeing some of these Scottish comedians, have a look at it right now and you know, maybe book them because you will probably be able to resell if for any reason you had to cancel. And those tickets are generally quite hard to get later. Alrighty then, that is all. Fringe, museums, trams, don't take the train. <laughs> Do take the train, but just expect it to maybe suck question mark. Um, yeah, if there's anything that I forgot that you have already put into like your 2023 Scotland or Edinburgh plans, and obviously I didn't by any means cover everything that's happening in Scotland in 2023, I would love to know. Let me know in the comments below. I, I am so curious if there's anything like that you specifically are super excited to attend in 2023 or if there are any like new museums or like gallery shows that I maybe didn't manage to see while I was researching this. Uh, yeah, let's talk about it down in the comment section. If you're missing some nice pictures of what Edinburgh looks like, then don't forget to visit me on Instagram, on Kaki blog for my photography and just kind of life in Edinburgh, and Kaki bot for some artwork and kind of like updates from my Etsy store. Link to my Etsy store is gonna be down in the doobly-doo together with other links to my socials. Uh, I am also kind of considering to like start like a Patreon page or maybe coffee page in 2023. Um, let me know maybe if you have thoughts on that. I think, you know, it could get you perhaps some like early access to videos or maybe I could make some sort of like day vlogs, kind of more of an like an authentic, like Edinburgh local, just like goes about their day and things I do, you know, something that's not super like production heavy, but it's more like, let's hang out, you and I. Uh, if you pay me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's how Patreon works. I'm not gonna lie. Um, yeah, basically, you know, the the long haul goal is that maybe one day I will be able to only do this and not also my other job. Um, so that, that's the dream, you know, and I feel like Patreon could be one of the steps to take towards that dream. Um, yeah, so yeah, let me know in the comments below if that's something that you would like to support. If you'd like to support my dreams, that would be great. And I shall see you soon in a 20,000 subscribers Q&A video. Because yay, we reached 20,000. And probably thanks to many of you. If not, then don't forget to subscribe. Make it 21,000 very soon. <laughs>